Harvard is a community committed to the perpetuation of knowledge. Throughout our campuses in Cambridge and Boston, our students and faculty work across the traditional boundaries of academic disciplines to grapple with the 21st century's biggest questions. The answers to those questions aren't confined by national borders. That is why we engage highly talented individuals from all over the world to foster new ways of thinking and to promote innovative solutions. Overcoming boundaries, reaching across borders, our students, faculty, staff, and alumni are coming together to reinforce our intellectual and academic strengths to harness the power of one Harvard. We thought of cells as having a history that's very much like ourselves, where they go from something that is relatively ill-defined. You know, we are, as children, thinking that we could become anything, and probably could, but as we get progressively older, we end up becoming more and more specialized to become a certain kind of person doing a particular kind of work. It turns out that that rigidity of process is not true for cells, and that means that we can now take from any one of us a cell population from a simple biopsy or even blood draw and convert it back to a cell type that can become any part of us. We can get cells from people who have diseases that we otherwise understand very poorly. We can make those cells into the disease type that's affected. If that's the case, now we can start to have better tools to be able to understand those diseases and better tools to be able to discover new drugs. We haven't accomplished all of that quite yet, but I think that notion that cells have this ability to change from one state to another has really rocked the very foundations of biology. And so from the president's office came the opportunity to create a structure, Harvard Stem Cell Institute. From the surrounding members of the larger Harvard community came an interest and a willingness to participate in a structure that frankly, they didn't have to participate in, but they decided that there was something fundamentally valuable that they could do in a unique way here at Harvard. And that has brought us together to make what is really the largest aggregate of people doing stem cell research around the world. We've just arrived in Mumbai. Everyone's rather exhausted, but also very excited and charged up. And uh, we're gonna hit the road. We're gonna walk around the site and experience the city in the next few days. The Mumbai Studio, as we call it here at the GSD, is one of many projects, workshops, studios we'll do under this rubric of extreme urbanism. This is a fascinating project because it's 1,400 acres of land uh, in a prime location, but it's highly contested. It also has 100,000 squatters living there, what we call slums, and so there are problems of housing, problems of hygiene, etc. One intention is to create kind of a research culture, uh, but also to give back to the city, and so so what we do is we always associate ourselves with local NGOs who become part of the project, who assist us in our fieldwork. And we see this as creating instruments for advocacy for these groups so that they actually have this research which they can use and it becomes a great way that the university can give back. The student chemistry on these projects is fantastic because it's so unpredictable. You have business school students who come into a studio like this you know, with their numbers and their calculators all ready to maximize profit on the site. Design school students who are only concerned about the moral dimensions of what they might do and invariably at the end of the semester they're kind of speaking each other's language very easily. Projects like this create very interesting crossovers between schools which otherwise tend to get siloed. I can see students in my class feeling much more comfortable taking a course in another school after having done the studio because they've suddenly, you know, been exposed to another dimension, another way of looking at the same problem. when you have a great financial aid program is that it sends a message to people who provide excellence across the board 
uh, that Harvard is open to them. Harvard has a long history of being a leader in the field of financial aid. But recently, in the course of the past decade, we've expanded the financial aid program in a way that has been really revolutionary. And it has enabled us to really cast a very wide net. When I was eight years old, I was performing in Sanders Theater with the Revels Company, so I was sort of, I knew what Harvard campus was, and I was used to being here, but it was, it always seemed like sort of a far off dream for me. I remember opening uh, my email, and I saw that I'd been accepted, and at first, I, I really didn't believe it. I thought it was a joke. And then when I got my financial aid reward, along with the acceptance letter, I knew that it was gonna be possible, and it was just, it was an incredible feeling. The School of Public Health really tries to promote healthy ideas for a healthier world. That's what we're all about. And in order to do that, we need our students to come in and really be able to go back and make um, career plans that don't involve cost in order for them to go back to the communities and really make a difference. Being a public service school, we have students coming from many backgrounds, whether it be the public sector or the private sector, but the majority of our students have limited resources. So since 2004, we've seen our financial aid double. Ability to pay doesn't become a filter that filters students out of being able to either consider coming to Harvard Law School or if they're admitted to being able to come. That gives us the academically strongest population and the most diverse population, and that the two go hand in hand. And so now at Harvard College, really over 10% of the students come from over 80 countries, and this dramatically expands the classroom experience, really, for all of the students who are here at the college. My life was totally transformed. I was very lucky to have financial aid to make Harvard possible for me. Today, we're transforming many, many more students, many, many more lives, and this really allows Harvard to have a multiplier effect on the positive things that it does in the world after students are here. The Doctor of Education Leadership Program is a brand new degree here at Harvard. It's a three-year professional degree, like a medical degree or a law degree, except this one's in education and it's for people who are going to be leaders. We're trying to do something audacious and necessary. It's helping them not just transform what exists, but create things that haven't existed. Because schools have looked the way they've looked for 120 years. You don't need to learn the same stuff that you used to because you can look it up in Wikipedia in 10 seconds. And so this program is trying to help not just change the way stuff is, but reimagine a totally different kind of learning environment in which every child in America can learn. And we need different ways of thinking outside of our own education boxes. Education leaders need to know a lot about learning and teaching. They need to be able to run complex organizations and they need to be able to manage the political environment. And we said, well, at the ed school, we know education really well. The business school, they really help people learn how to run organizations. And at the Kennedy School of Government, they know a lot about politics. As we've gotten going, we're partnering with more and more schools across Harvard. Our students in their first year core curriculum do a project with the design school. Next year, we're partnering with the Kennedy School and the School of Public Health. And our students take lots of classes at other schools as well. The course we launched last year, which is called Innovation and Entrepreneurship, was kind of born of three impulses. In the most mundane sense, we wanted to make sure that undergraduates knew about the iLab, and we thought the best way to do that was to have a course offering here. The second level of kind of ambition for the course was was to have the business school and the undergraduates interact more. There's just this remarkable pool of talent in the undergraduate population. And then the final impulse is the most lofty, which is to really try to manifest the idea of one university. And we thought, what better way to do that than with a class? Really the bread and butter of what we do. And what we really try to do is expose students to uh, an intellectual foundation for understanding the nature of entrepreneurship and innovation. Do that in a practical way, which is associated with case studies and real live examples. Intersperse that with these lectures from leading lights around the university and then have it culminate in a project where they were linked with either a private kind of venture capital firm, a startup, uh, a policy organization, uh, or a governmental organization. The projects reinforced 
and challenged ideas that were provided in the case method discussions. The interactive lectures contrasted with the case discussions. So I think that was a rich educational experience. But I think more broadly, you know, I think we all learned things. The course really drew on people from around the university, most obviously the college and the business school, but we had folks coming from the law school, the Kennedy School, the Ed School, FAS, and of course all the projects were from alumni from all over the university. To me it was a lesson in how much we can do when we just simply overlook some of the traditional boundaries.